Hi, welcome to Empowering the Whole Child, Uniting Universal Design for Learning and Social Emotional Learning at the California UDL Summit 2024. I'm Sung Park from the Inclusion Collaborative at Santa Clara County Office of Education, and it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Lisa Bozio. Lisa Bozio has been a passionate educator for over 20 years with one goal, to equip and empower teachers to invest in and impact the whole child academically, behaviorally, socially, and emotionally. Lisa has extensive experience as a classroom teacher, master teacher, and district instructional coach. Before joining Novak Educational Consulting full-time, Lisa was an induction mentor in the Sylvan Union School District in California, where she supported new teachers with implementing teaching best practices. Everyone, please welcome Lisa Bozio. Hey, everyone. Um, number one, I wish I was there in person with you, but... I, obviously working for Novak, um, I have clients that I'm meeting with um, from the beautiful state of Hawaii and had a conflict. So this is how we're going to roll today. I am super excited to be here with you. I, by the way, for all of you who are TCSJ students in the room, just give a quick shout out like whoop whoop or something along that line. So let me hear you. Are anybody out there? No one? Okay, no worries. I used to, actually, I am originally from Modesto, California, just moved from uh, to Davis, where I'm currently residing here in the beautiful city of Davis, where UC Davis is located. And I used to be an instructor at TCSJ. So I loved it. Um, I worked in my former school district is Sullivan Union School District in Modesto, California. So I am very local. Um, and I am so excited to help you or come and really kind of partner with you on some key strategies that you could use tomorrow, because that's what I know educators want. They're like, we just need something tomorrow. What can I do to remove barriers for my students, both academically and social and emotionally? So without further ado, we are going to go ahead and get going. Again, nice to meet you, Lisa Bozio. Just a quick intro. Um Obviously, son gave you that, which is fabulous. Here are my two beautiful children, my daughter, Michaela, who just married her uh, son in love, my son in love, uh, Jeremiah, two years ago, and my son, Josh. And they are my biggest blessing and my legacy and why I chose to leave um, public relations journalism with, in the corporation sector and became an educator. So... Um, didn't know anything about teaching ever. <laughs> so I had to unlearn a lot of things, educators. And in my journey as an educator, um, I just have learned to unlearn a lot of preconceived notions, the way I was taught, um, whatever that I brought to my learning and teaching environment, and really started to embrace how can I support the whole child, not just them, like, Miss Bozio, what grade am I getting? Those type of things. I really wanted my kids to flourish. I really wanted them to not just survive, but I wanted them to thrive. But honestly, educators, this has been a journey. <laughs> and it continues to be a journey. So I'm going to share some things that I have learned along the way and um, how I have um, st dabbled with UDL, like, back in 2009. <laughs> because... In Modesto, I worked in a high trauma, high poverty, uh, low socioeconomic, and uh, one size fits all fit none of my kids, or maybe one. And so I had to like delve into and do my own research when nobody was really talking about that. They were talking more about fidelity to curriculum, which, you know, okay. But um, equality, giving kids all the same thing is not equity, people. It's not. We really do need to be thinking strategically on how to meet all of our learners' needs. So I'm going to start with, because we are wrapping in both UDL and SEL. So we need to, and honestly, I do a lot of instructional coaching in my former school district in Sylvan, but I do a lot of instructional coaching with districts, with offices of educations worldwide on coming alongside lovely people, beautiful people like you, and partnering together um, to wrap up 
and wrap in UDL and SEL. So it's not another thing that you have to do on your plates, right? Educators, you're like tired. <laughs> and we need to start doing what I call do the weave. So we're going to start with an SEL practice, which is called an inclusive opening. It's from the Castle SEL three signature practices, a way that you can do this tomorrow with your students to wrap in UDL and SEL. So inclusive opening, here you go. And I love this quote, how you enter into a space. So however you entered into this space and how you leave this space is as important as what happens in the space. Because what I know is this educators, you all have a story. You all have things on your heart. You all have things. Your kids come in with story. They come in with um, hurts, traumas, what excitement. And if we don't understand how social and emotional learning actually helps the brain learn and get engaged and how we can mitigate some of those fight, flight, or freeze things that happen with our kids, and we can have a universally designed lesson. They're not going to learn. They won't. They're not going to be able to access that part of the brain. So here's an inclusive opening. I want you to do a check-in. So you probably do this with your students, but here's a super cool way, one way to do a check-in. So take a moment and reflect and answer the following questions. Okay. So you're going to reflect and you can reflect on a post-it note because firm goal, which is all about UDL. Okay. Firm goal. We're all going to be reflecting on the following questions, but I'm going to give you flexible pathways. I'm not going to tell you everybody turned your partner. <laughs> I'm not. Because some of you are like, I haven't had coffee today. I don't want to talk to anybody. Okay. And that's cool, right? So coming into our meeting, what's on your mind? Could be personal. It could be professional. It could be whatever that looks like. Something that you are concerned about or something that's on your heart, Right that honestly could be a distractor to this 60 minutes or so that we have together that we will never get back, educators. We won't. So what can you do to lay it aside? Okay, because, and I'm not saying like, oh, la, la, la. Like, oh, just don't think about it. I'm saying, put it on a note. Chat with a partner. Whatever you need to do. Stick it on a chart of paper. If you have something there, it doesn't matter. What is it that's on your heart that you need to, just for our time together today, you can lay it aside. Okay, so I'm going to give you about a minute to reflect. You can chat with a partner if that's how you like, prefer to process. Or you can write it down in a sticky note, a piece of paper, open up a tag, put it on, you know, Google Doc, I don't know, whatever. Okay, two minutes or about a minute and a half just for the sake of time, reflecting, and then what can you do to lay it aside? to stay focused today. Go. And, 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 All right, so here's the key, educators. Here's a question for you, and I don't even have it posted. I'm just going to roll with it. You can chat with a partner. You can write it down. How do you welcome your kids and connect them, which is one of the Castle 3 signature 
practices, which you're going to be able to look at in just a bit, what do you do to welcome your kids in your classroom to create that sense of belonging, to have them maybe do a check-in on where they're at in their emotional state so that you're aware of, hey, what's going on? So turn to a partner, just like 30 seconds. What are some check-ins you do? Because I know you do. What are they? About 10, about 15 seconds, chat it with a partner, write it down. all right about 10 seconds just take to wrap that up all right. I be able to check that out. That's why you need that bit.ly because I have links on here that you will be able to look at. And keep, this deck is forever yours, okay? So our time is going to be quick, but you can go back and look at some of these UDL, SEL uh, resources that I have for you. So learning intentions, let's start off. You hopefully will leave. <laughs> the whole intention of this time is for you to understand the integration of UDL and social emotional learning. We need to do that, educators. You have too much on your plates. You work too hard, honestly. SEL was never intended to be a 30-minute lesson. Castle never intended it to be, uh, even though you may have beautiful curriculum and you please use it. Think about how you can weave it in throughout the day, okay? Secondly, we're going to learn how to design academic lessons, just the starting with a super cool document that we at Novak have created with the uh, state of Washington teachers that support universal design, and you'll be able to look at UDL through that lens, okay? Your learning opportunities, your lesson design, and build in those SEL five core competencies that Castle talks about. So you just saw me do an inclusive welcome, okay? And it's part of the Castle three signature practices where it, it was linguistically and culturally respectful. I didn't ask you to discuss what did you do with your parents? We know some children may not have parents. They may have caregivers. We, you know, we have to be very intentional on what we pose to our kids to welcome them, to create that sense of belonging, to get that brain ready. And it connects to the work ahead, right? I had you do a check-in because if your brains aren't ready, you're exhausted, you haven't had coffee, you had a fight with your partner, I don't know, you got a ticket on the way over. I don't know. Those are things that it are going to inhibit the learning process if we don't allow some sort of check-in with our kids to see where they're at and then do a maybe check-in with that child later. Now, one thing that I heard, and I'm just going to throw out this quick tip. One of the educators that I work with, at the end of any assessment, whether it be a formal or informal, so it's part of the assessment, okay, just checking in if what kids know and understand, she says, is there anything you want me to know that I need to know? Anything you want to share? And what she has said is, <laughs> blows her mind. Kids will say, um, my mom and my dad are getting a divorce. Okay. Um, my aunt just found out she had cancer. Or I'm super excited because we're going to Disneyland. Right. So 
even doing that sort of check-in on some assessment, kids are going to start learning how to open up and it's very confidential, but it'll really give you a pulse on them developing that self-awareness, but also you checking in with them. Okay. So we did that today. And throughout this, you're going to see engaging strategies. I'm going to have you turn and talk to your partner. You're going to have some self-differentiation time. And then we're going to do what Castle talks about as an intentional close, meaning, okay, what are we going to do with the learning? What are you going to do with the learning that your kids did? And how are you going to close that experience for your kids? Like, what are, what are their next steps, right? So those are the Castle 3 signature practices. And so when we talk about UDL and CASEL, SEL, we are really going to help students delve into that deeper learning. And we're going to talk about some super cool strategies in order for you to do that. And so and we're back to school after the holidays. And you may be in what a client in Canada told me. Teachers are in like the February funk right now, right? Like, you know, the holidays are over and we've got kids who like are, yes, I am ready to roll. It's even February. I could care less, right? I am, yep, I am ready to go, right? They are ready to roll. The brains are ready. They missed everybody. Even in February, and it's been raining, whatever it is, they're ready. And what I can predict also educators is this. We have kids who are like, uh, nope. They are not ready. They Their brains are ready. And that's why educators, we really, really have to be strategically thinking about how can we remove barriers to their, their lessons, right? They're what they're in that in your learning environment. But also, how do we support our kids to develop that self-awareness and that self-management and social awareness that the Castle 5 does? And weave those in throughout the day. So that we don't have kids saying the nope, right? We want our kids to come and feel welcome. So what we know and why we need to really wrap in both UDL and SEL is that all students differ. None learn the same. You know that if you have children, you know your students, if you are an auntie or an uncle, whatever that is, they all learn different. And here's the deal. They vary and they learn in what they learn and how they learn based upon the content. And, and, and educators, I'll tell you this, and I know this is going to debunk some of the things that I learned in the credential program that I was super jazzed about. There is no such thing as a learning style. Not. That has been debunked. What there is is learning preferences. So certain students and yourself too, think about you as a learner. Yeah. You prefer sometimes, like, okay, I hate reading manuals to put things together. I'd rather watch a YouTube video. Show me how to do it, and I just, I don't want to read, and I can't understand these manuals, and it just takes too long. Like, I'm like, let's be efficient. Show me how, and I'll do it, okay? But I'm not going to go watch a video on somebody teaching or discussing um, UDL and really make it applicable for me. I want to read it. I want to try it. I want to annotate a book about it, right? Same with our kids. They vary in the content. They vary in their mood state. They vary. That's why we cannot have a one size fits all. We cannot give kids every child gets the same thing. It doesn't work. You know that. I know that. And that's why we have to universally design our, our lessons and start weaving in SEL, five core competencies, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. So here's the deal. As somebody who does professional development, was trying to apply universal design for learning in my learning environment in Sylvan when I was teaching as a teacher there, and then as an induction mentor and master teacher supporting teachers, um, I thought UDL was, oh, it's just all about choice. <laughs> nope. No, it's a belief system. And if you don't have this belief system, which is something that I have come to embrace, it wasn't like, oh, yes, I believe it. It is. This was a journey for me, educators, since 2008, 2009, okay? And I'm still a learner, okay? 
this is the belief system, and then you'll be able to universally design your learning environment. You'll be able to start removing barriers and offering strategic choices and options because you believe that variability is the rule, meaning that not all students learn the same. And before you ever launch a lesson, you are going to look at that through the UDL lens, even using the framework, which we'll talk about, or you're noticing, oh my gosh, some of my kids are not going to be able to read this. This text, it's either boring, it's not relevant, or they're not able to read it. What scaffolds can I put into place for them? How can I remove those barriers? Okay. So I proactively plan ahead. Okay. I'm not just flipping through like I did when I first started teaching. Okay. Flipping through my curriculum and just teaching page after page. Okay. I became a very standard based teacher, and that's where your UDL starts. Second, I, a UDL practitioner, has to truly believe this, educators, that all students, and we cannot do the blame, shame, and the rename game. Well, you know, those are EL learners. You know, I mean, I've heard it all, and I've said them all myself, where they weren't my kids. Like, oh, those are the resource kids. They belong to the SPED. No, no, they are all our kids, and all students can, can thrive And learn at high levels, but some are just going to need a little bit more support. Because here's the deal, educators. Here's a belief system. All students are gen ed students. Every single one of the kids that are in your classroom or you support are gen ed students. They're, They're not that person, that person's responsibility. They are first gen ed students, but some just need a little extra support. And if we look at it like that, we're going to start looking at our lesson design and our learning environment and say, ooh, that's going to be an obstacle for my kid or kids, and I need to change that and offer some strategic choices and options, okay? Third, all students can become expert learners if barriers are removed, okay? That's our job. Eventually, though, educators, I will tell you because I saw it, and I see it with teachers that I support, and I saw it in my classroom, You create that safe environment where kids can actually start taking risks by making a few choices that you offer. They're going to come to you and say, you know what, that's a, that's going to be a barrier for me. Can I, can I have another option? And you're like, yeah, sure. Tell tell me, what are you thinking? So you start co-creating and co-generating a learning environment. Now, am I saying you're going to have to do that tomorrow? Heck no. (laughs) You got to build a culture. That's a whole nother thing that I coach, but It's a belief system, educators, and if we don't hold firm to these beliefs, it will become a checklist for you, and that's not what universal design for learning is. It is a framework. It's a way to lesson plan. So let's talk about this framework very briefly. The UDL framework, it's a lesson planning tool that will help you as educators make learning accessible for all your learners because the ultimate goal for UDL isn't just to throw choices out there. It's not. It's to create expert learners because when they start choosing like you do, you start learning, oh, you know what? In this situation, I learn best by watching a video. In this situation, I learn best by collaborating with my colleagues. In this situation, I learn best by whatever, okay? So we know that there are three types of barriers, okay? How they connect, that's why we provide multiple means of engagement. Like, how do we recruit interest? Do you share your learning intention or your learning goal with your kids and not just read it, but really like dive into it and say, hey, this is what this explain means this. Like, are we engaging our kids with that firm goal? Okay. Secondly, how do they learn? Do we provide multiple means of representation? How do they access information? How are they developing comprehension skills? Are they all reading the same text? I mean, how are we giving them information is crucial. We need to provide choices and options for that. And then thirdly, how do they demonstrate their learning? How can they create a plan for their learning? Like, I'm going to choose this because I know I need this in order to learn, okay? Where, honestly, educators, it becomes a student-centered learning environment. They drive their learning. And ultimately, I'm not saying, no, no, no. Ultimately, you become a facilitator of learning. Why? Because you're going to provide, initially, a few choices. Okay, and we're going to talk about that. So, the whole goal of the UDL is to create expert learners. And when we engage them, when we give them time to cultivate those SEL skills that we're going to talk about, your kids are going to become purposeful and motivated. Because they're going to be part of that process. 
when you provide multiple means of representation where they can access information and learn from things and develop vocabulary and comprehension skills in a couple different ways that work for them, some tools in their toolbox, they are going to be resourceful because guess what, educators? They're not going to ask you, I don't know what to do. No, (laughs) they're going to be like, oh, I, I know exactly what I need to get. I know exactly that I need to work with you, teacher, to get extra support. And I'm going to come to your small group and math because that's what I need. Okay, or I'm going to watch a Khan Academy a video, or I'm going to work with a partner. They understand what they're going to need. Okay. Third, when we provide multiple means of action and expression, meaning how they demonstrate their learning, they become super strategic because they're engaged. It's not a one size fits all. They become like, okay, how am I going to show that I understand this? learning what the standard is asking them to know and be able to do. Okay. So that's the UDL framework in a nutshell. Remember it's a belief system. When we hold to those beliefs, those three beliefs in that prior slide that all students can be expert learners, but it's up for us to remove those barriers ahead of time and provide some strategic choices and uh, choices. And I would say, would you rather, would you rather two choices? And you're going to look at a document in just a moment to kind of help you with that. You're going to start developing these expert learners, okay? And guess what? Educators are going to start, stop asking you, what's my grade? (laughs) Because you're going to help them reflect on their learning. And you're going to say what I used to tell my kids in middle school. No, don't ask me about your grade. Tell me what you're learning. Where are you at in in that rubric? And these are things that I do as an instructional coach for Novak to come alongside and partner with teachers to help them do this. So in just a moment, you're going to have two options just to kind of check out two resources to kind of help you dive into either this document, which is hot linked right here. Okay. So I'm going to open it up and you're going to see that it goes through each of the uh, three different principles of universal design for learning. And it asks the kids, would you rather, would you rather people start off with two choices? Like, and honestly, and I'm, there's a whole science behind this, but I'm just going to tell you no more than, no more than four choices. So here's the deal. TPT, which, okay, I'm not begging on TPT, but they have choice boards on there on steroids, 10, 12 choices, too many choices. It causes analysis paralysis. That's what I call it. So start off with, would you rather? And I love this document created by our organization with the help of the state of Washington, beautiful teachers. And it goes through each one of the principles, multiple means of engagement. So it'll give you a traditional practice, a barrier and some choices and options. This has been a game changer for teachers that I support just to start with some strategic choices that ultimately educators will lead your learners to whatever that learning intention, whatever the standard is asking them to know and be able to do. We have to be looking at what the standards are asking our kids to know and be able to do. This document goes through all three of the principles. You're going to have a moment in just a, in just a minute to kind of check that out, okay? Or maybe you're like, you know what? And I want to look at that Castle 3, at the SEL signature practices, okay? So and notice You're going to have some time to explore, learn, and apply. So I just kind of gave you an overview of universal design for learning, how to provide some choices and options that are strategic, but it's based on a belief system. It's not a checklist, okay? You decide, firm goal. We are learning how to remove barriers. That's Everybody is doing this right now. But am I telling you, and all of you need to look at would you rather? No, no, I'm not. I'm not telling you that. I'm giving you what I call flexible pathways. Okay? So take about, and that's why you need this bit.ly. It's located here on the slide. You choose. I'm going to give you about three or four minutes just to start exploring one of the two documents. You can chat and explore with colleagues. You can explore independently. And then you're going to do just a brief connection with your table mates. Hey, what did you look at? What are some thoughts and applications? Okay, so take about three or so, four minutes. Have some time. You decide what flexible pathway you want to choose to start just creating that either that welcoming environment 
with the Castle SEL3 or Would You Rather? And you decide how you want to do that, and then I'll call you back. And at your table, you're just going to do a quick chit chat. Okay, go. And, 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 and 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 all right hey son and and team out there you beautiful people go ahead and just chat with a partner super quick like you can get up and find a partner if you want it's got to be quick though fabulous people um what'd you look at what are some applications and if you don't want to talk to anybody just you know Hang by and continue to explore, but we have about another minute. Oh. All right. Sung, if you can just kind of do a count to 10 and kind of bring those beautiful people back. One, two, three, four. Let's come on back, folks. Back. <laughs> All right. Hey, hopefully, again, I know this is. A fast and furious. I get it. But again, you have those two resources that you can check out to start thinking strategically either how to create that welcoming environment that's part of the castle of five core competencies that you actually see on here, and how to think about strategically removing barriers. Because honestly, educators, we need both. If we want our kids to be deeper learners and not just like it was in my class for quite a while. <clears throat> And I taught multiple grade levels, by the way, and middle school as well. Um, yeah, they would just regurgitate information and then they would forget it. I wanted my kids to be critical thinkers. I wanted them to do the 21st century skills. But the way I designed my lessons, it wasn't happening <laughs> because there were too many barriers in there. So, again, UDL and the Castle five, five per competency is going to equal deeper learning. So let's talk about what that strategically looks like in your learning environment. I'm just going to um, skip that for now, just for the sake of time, because I do really want to delve into like some super cool applications that either I've seen teachers do, or I've researched for you, or maybe you're already doing. But why do we need to incorporate social emotional learning in our classrooms? It should get the brain ready to go. I love Zaretta Hammond's work. If you're not familiar with her book, the author of Cultural Responsive Teaching in the Brain, people get it. It's fabulous. It talks about how we create these critical thinkers and problem solvers, and we don't leave kids out. We don't. We don't make excuses for kids. It's high rigor. We have high expectations, but she calls it a warm demander, and I love that. Like, we demand excellence in our classroom, but we're very warm about it. We need to get away from that punitive thing that I was schooled in Modesto, California. I mean, it was all punitive in many respects. So, which is why I never thought I'd be a teacher. But anyway, here I am, right? So think about how we need to get kids to cultivate that classroom and how you can do that where students feel safe because if they don't, they, by and large, your kids won't learn. They're going to be too busy trying to feel safe, okay? So how do we do that? We're going to go ahead now and weave in. I call it do the weave. We're going to weave in UDL and Castle Deep Learning. Now, 
when we talk about multiple means of engagement, that inclusive welcome that we did hopefully got your brain thinking, you were able to do a check-in, you're able to kind of build that self-awareness, right? That social awareness. If you chatted with a partner, um, you were able to build relationship skills, you know, work on those type of things, right? Providing multiple means of representation. I just want you to kind of see the tie-in here, okay? We we provide engaging strategies. I gave you time to self-differentiate, which is part of the UDL framework, the lesson design that I coach people with, right? So you had to learn how to manage that. You had to create an opportunity for sense-making, uh, supporting your learning. You got to choose. Then maybe you wanted to chat with a partner and process. Hey, I looked at this document, super helpful. Or, you know, I never thought about having a welcoming activity or inclusive welcoming activity into my classroom, right? And then when we close out, and you're going to see me close it out in just a bit, you have to reflect, <laughs> part of the UDL framework. Um, reflection is key. And something I didn't do a lot in my own classroom, educators, I would just be skipping along and not having my kids have some time to reflect on their learning and applications in that deeper thinking, okay? So you're going to see an intentional close. You're going to have to make some decisions like, I learned something today. What am I going to do about it, right? So just doing just that Castle SEL three signature practices can start cultivating and encompassing both UDL and SCL. So the power of social emotional learning, I'm going to focus on the Castle five core competencies. And one thing I do want to call to your attention is if you look at the wheel, these core competencies start here, educators, starts with us. Like, it's not about the parents. It starts with us. Like, how can we intertwine these? And then it moves to the whole white school and then the community and the home, right? So I'm going to go skip forward. So hopefully it won't bug your eyes. So I'm, let's delve into each of the core competencies. I have listed some super cool things that you may use or you may be like score I can use that and I'm not going to open up each one of these some of them are self-explanatory because when we think about self-awareness if we want to create these expert learners they have to be emotionally aware right educators of where their brain space is they're coming into our space with what trauma things on their brain they've been gaming all night I don't know they're hungry like they have to be self-aware, okay, emotionally. That's where that feelings wheel comes in. You can click on that later. Fabulous, right? Getting kids just to be self-aware. But here's the deal, educators. In a UDL classroom that's universally designed, that's student-centered and student-focused and student-driven, your students have to have choices. They have to. Not willy-nilly like mine were initially. <laughs> they were willy-nilly. I didn't know any better. But when you know better, you do better. I ended up learning that UDL always starts off with a firm goal. What is the standard asking them to know and be able to do? So I became very familiar with my standards, not my curriculum, although curriculum is great. It's got a lot of stuff in there that maybe isn't standard-based or part of what your kids essentially have to learn. When students make choices, they have to become self-aware of what they need. Boom. There's your UDL. There's your SEL. Okay? So I... One thing I'm going to click on that I think that I love that one of our um, consultants created and revised is this document that is called a learning profile. So, you know, we all do those interest surveys, right? But this learning profile actually asks your students how they learn best. Like, what do they need? How do they need to access? What do they need to engage? And so it kind of takes the UDL principles and it helps the kids become reflectors. Why? Because they become self-aware of what they need. This right here is brilliant. <laughs> and I, what I, when I support educators with this, even if you're in junior high or high school and you've got 150 kids, all of your kids can fill it out. Start with your most strategic. And don't use this just at the beginning of the year. This can be a reflective document throughout the year. Maybe at a parent-teacher conference, at the end of a semester. Hey, this is where you were in light of 
what helped you access information and engage, but are you still there? Is that still what you need? Educators, having them think about what they need and that develops that castle first core competency, self-awareness. So I've got some super cool things for you to check out to build self-awareness, but I also say do the weave. So how can we weave it in throughout our lesson design? So do you ask students to identify their personal strengths and weaknesses that they like to work on? We all have them. And we really want our students and us as educators to become very asset-based, not deficit, not what I stink at, or I'm, I, I'm bad at math. No, no, no. You have a lot of assets. Let's fo- get your kids focusing on those. Develop those. That develops self-awareness. Listen deeply. I had to learn this. To what students are saying, and I gave you a sentence frame. It sounds like you're feeling angry. Did I get that right? So we don't go into the fix-it mode. They start feeling like, oh, yeah, I am feeling angry. Hey, where are you feeling that? Right here? Do you want to do some breathing? Do you want to write a, do a quick write? Like, what do you need right now to kind of get that out, right? That's doing the weave. Use your literature, your science, your ELA, your history, whatever you're doing, where they can do kind of a character analysis. And, hey, have you had the same feelings as that character? This is That's weaving in self-awareness throughout your lesson design, right? Helping them become self-aware. Castle, five core competency. Second, self-management. Second core competency. I am a huge advocate, and even in middle school and high school, do you, and if you don't, there's no blame, shame, or judgment here, educators. I am still learning as a UDL practitioner. Do you have some sort of calm corner um, where kids can go and decompress so they're not leaving your learning environment? They can actually chill out and kind of take a break. I have created um, a calm corner, a video, and a middle for middle school settings. Obviously, you're not going to be able to look at those now, but in order for kids to manage their emotions, and honestly, it's, we want to keep them in our classroom, right? We want to let them know it's okay if you need a break. Hey, take a break. I used to take breaks in my own classroom because I'd be like, hey, you know what, students? I'm feeling really, and I would model this, educators. I'm feeling really frustrated right now. And I wouldn't say, because you're not listening. I would just say I'm feeling really frustrated right now because right now it's feeling a little chaotic in my class. I wouldn't say, you know, and, you know, Lisa, you're just getting on my nerves, right? I would think it, but I wouldn't say it, okay? So creating a corner. Do you have self-reg ideas for teens and tweens? Here's some super cool things, but let me tell you how to weave these in. These are just some brilliant ideas for you to start helping kids self-manage. But let's do the weave. Do you, could you lead a discussion in which the teacher asks questions that encourage students to reflect on barriers, barriers in their learning, barriers that are getting in their way that are causing them to causing them to be triggered about certain things and what can they do to kind of self-manage those things could they journal write could they take a time out could they could you send them on an errand to go see another teacher like you I started to get in touch with what my kids needed and that's even in middle school okay because it really helped de-escalate a lot of stuff that was going on in the classroom when the kids now Miss Bozio has got my back and she's got, we discussed a couple different strategies that would work for me. Okay. Lead a discussion and ask questions about who might be able to help or what are the resources. And here's the deal. If they're going to make choices in your classroom with a video, with manipulatives, how are they going to manage those? What's the plan for management? Are you clear? Are you consistent? And are they clear? Like, Hey, here's some manipulatives. You're welcome to use them. They are, uh, they are a tool. They're not a toy. If they become a toy, then what you're showing me is, is that you just need to take a break from that, right? So again, high expectations, but how do we help kids self-manage, not just their emotions, but if they're going to make strategic choices, how are they going to manage that, okay? Third castle core competency, developing that social awareness. And this I love this um, because 
in a learning environment where students are learning together and collaborating, they have to build empathy with one another. They have to learn how to perspective take. So I have built in two things here that I think are brilliant that you're going to be able to look at in just a moment. Um, one of these is, and I'm going to just click on it super quick. It's from um, it's from Harvard, and you can see on here it's learning how to take perspectives. And here's the beautiful thing about this is that you can do like click on one. I'll just click on like um, see think see think me we. Okay, so I'm going to click on that. So how do we develop perspective taking people? It gives you a whole lesson here, resource links, and some of them, like it'll give you like SEL, look closely at the work. What do you notice? What do you wonder? Think, what thoughts do you have? Okay, so it gives you different ideas, different things you can actually help your students take different perspectives. This one, a lot of them are in Spanish. So it gives you the whole entire lesson how to do it, what to do, how to help kids learn and take others' perspectives is crucial to develop that social awareness. It not only builds empathy, but it helps our kids to understand that other people's opinions and perspectives aren't wrong. They're just different. And we, why can't we learn from one? We can agree to disagree, but why can't we learn to be respectful? right? And build that social awareness and build that social awareness that the way the choices that I make in a group situation, when I'm collaborating, because that's a lot of UDL, our kids should be given the choice to collaborate. And sometimes they have to collaborate because our standards say they have to listen and speak and collaborate, right? So perspective taking that Harvard thing is brilliant. That's a way quick way for you to kind of bring that into social studies, ELA, math, whatever you're teaching, PE, doesn't matter. How can they take others' perspectives? Now, one thing that I'm a huge advocate and I train people on, and I was actually working in a district here in California, a couple of them, with restorative practices, not restorative justice, but restorative circles, okay? I can't dive into that now, but I am telling you, people, if, and it could be a morning meeting, it doesn't have to, but doing a circle practice and starting off with, and I created a video, the what, why, and how, love this. Here's a teacher circle, brilliant, having teachers actually sit in a circle. And here's some circle questions, because listen, you don't want to start off with, all right, how is everybody feeling today about la la? I mean, you don't want to go deep right away. You've got to scaffold it. So. How to build social awareness, perspective, listening to others. Circles are brilliant. And it's a way to help kids understand perspective of others and to feel safe in that learning community to actually share. Now, that's a culture and that's something you have to develop. This is a place to start. Okay. So, building social awareness, let's do the weave. How do we build in diversity by having students share? cultural or different perspectives and not just having like a cultural day, but having discussions about different cultures and celebrating those, right? Provide students with opportunities to share in small groups. There you go. Circles. Teach students appropriate group behavior. If they're going to work in groups, educators, we have to be super clear on the protocol on what that behavior looks and sound like for kids and then model that. Okay. Demonstrate examples and non-examples of how to how to work, how to agree and disagree, right? And we're going to talk about that in a minute. And embed in, in gratitude. Help kids find the things that they're grateful for and start that with you. It could be a gratitude jar. It could be a gratitude journal. It could be whatever. But the whole gratitude piece, neuroscience shows, it just changes those neural pathways and helps us turn our focus, not maybe on our problems or what's going on, but on what we're grateful for. Okay. Next core competency. Let's talk about building relationship skills. How do we do that? 
one way, and I had a video, but I also put the sentence frame. If kids are going to disagree, which happened all the time in my classroom, especially as I started cultivating a very collaborative classroom where they did a lot of work together or they worked separately and then they came together. That was an option for some of my kids, right? Here's a sentence frame, but there's also a great video for that that you can check out. <clears throat> when you stick your tongue out at me, I feel sad because it makes me feel like you don't like me. So what I would like is for you to tell me if something's bothering you versus sticking your tongue out at me. Okay. So I love this frame because it's naming the emotion. It's not attacking the person. And it's also helping our kids advocate for themselves. Meaning I would like is, I would like you to, so it names what you want them to do, right? That builds relationship skills. And honestly, educators, here's the deal. What I love about the Castle Five is that they may never remember what they learned about a character or math or they may not. Honestly, I look back at my education, I'm like, what did I learn about geometry? You know what I mean? But here's the deal. These skills are going to be lifetime. They're not, they're not just called soft skills. I call them lifetime skills helping them develop relationship skills. So got some super cool things there. Weave in, do the weave, collaborate in group norms, have students routinely evaluate how they worked in a group. So once they work in a group, do you have them evaluate? How did you do in your group? Based on a couple different questions, were you listening effectively? And what does that look and sound like for kids? Because sometimes they think they're listening and they're really not, okay? Do you have them reflect on their own behavior, how they related to their colleagues? And do you model scenarios like examples and non-examples of, hey, this is building relationships. This is a respectful tone. This is how we communicate when we disagree. This is how we appropriately disagree. Not, you know, that was a dumb answer. What were you thinking? Do you model that? Do you provide scenarios? I mean, honestly, educators, Two minutes, five minutes. Here's a scenario. Boom. And you can use chat GTP or <laughs> Google, but, you know, AI. Give me a scenario for this, and it'll come up with a scenario. So you can use your brain power to think creatively and let that AI robot thing do the thinking for you. And then you're going to tweak it because you know your kid's best, right? Lastly, and then you're going to have some time to check out some of the resources. I mean, Responsible decision-making. In my personal opinion, I think responsible decision-making, the last Castle 5 core competency that I'm discussing, really encompasses all. They have to be self-aware. They have to self-manage. They have to be socially aware. And they have to have strong, building strong relationship skills, right? So in order to do make responsible decisions, they have to have those, right? So Here's a couple great things, responsible uh, decision-making tree that you can use. And so I'm just going to showcase it. it talks about the Castle 5. And so you can scroll down. There's got a lot of great things on here. But I use this myself. And I use this with students. And I know teachers that I've shown this love this. So here's the decision. And then it brings you through the tree. So if kids are trying to make a, hey, what, do you, do you, would you like to use this tree to kind of help you understand kind of the pros and cons and really come to a responsible decision on how that decision is going to affect you, your peers, your family, your community, things like that, right? Instead of just making like spontaneous, like, oh, I'm just going to go do that. And yeah, it's just not a good thing. So that's a resource that you are welcome to check out. And um, I'm going to show you this. This is by one of uh, our fabulous colleagues. Again, it goes back to Project Zeros, um, the thinking types. And you can kind of walk through this. And he talks about compass points and how to do and utilize that. So, and obviously building routines and tools for reflecting. Do the weave. Once kids make choices, whether it be behavioral, academic, do you have them reflect? Multiple means of engagement in the UDL framework 
that last one, if you're not familiar, that last uh, checkpoint is reflection. And reflection is key if we want students to really gain understanding on not just their learning, but the choices they make in behavior. Uh, uh, did that choice help you learn more about the Civil War and the causes and effect? Okay, so I left it blank. What did you learn about yourself as a learner? Meaning, did that choice help you learn? If you watched a video, you read with a partner, like, because a lot of times my kids, honestly, they would say, no, actually, I just goofed off. And I'm like, oh, interesting. And that would be, people say, well, what if they make a poor choice? And I'm like, I don't know. Do you make good choices all the time? I don't. And I normally learn from my uh, poor choices or like, oh man, I wasn't thinking about that. We need to give grace to our kids for that. And given the choice again, would you make it? Why or why not? Okay. Again, give them scenarios, characters, use chat, GTP, whatever that looks like for you to create these scenarios, a five minute scenario. Kids love those and they have to critically think about the choices that have to be made. And so it gets that amygdala down. They have to think critically these are ways, educators, that you can wrap in social-emotional learning and do the weave with some of these uh, uh, items that I gave you. But really, think about how you can weave in the Council 5. Maybe you want to start off with the three signature practices. Fabulous, right? Do that. So what I'd like to do as we kind of wrap up our session, I'm going to give you time. You decide where you want to land, okay? You can select, and I suggest one core competency. Like if you thought, you know what? I really need to start building relationship skills. My kids are like ready to kill themselves, so, you know, beat one another up. I don't know. You know, kids are, kids are struggling. They are. And we educators, honestly, we need to support them. So you decide. Select one of the core competencies in slides 20 through 24. What? And commit to like doing one weave or implementing one of the fabulous resources that I have listed there. Or you can check out the Castle Five Core Competencies. You can click on that and learn more about that. It is an interactive wheel, and you're welcome to do that. Because eventually, educators, I'm going to show you, we're going to do an intentional close, and you are going to set a goal based on. Going back to our learning intentions, learning the integration of UDL and SEL, and thinking about how to start designing academic lessons that we remove some barriers of would you rather, would you rather, and building some SEL competencies. What can you do in three days, three weeks, three months? So that's going to be how we're going to wrap it up. So with that in mind, have some time for your own self-differentiation. We're all learning how to weave SEL throughout our learning day. Firm goal, people but I'm giving you flexible pathways to do so. Okay, five minutes and then, or actually probably four minutes, just pick one, pick something, and then we're going to do a quick chat and then we're going to close it out. Okay, four minutes, go. All right, fabulous educators. If you haven't had an opportunity to chat with a partner super quick regarding what you looked at, if that's what you want to do like process with somebody, you have about 30 seconds because we're going to wrap up our time because I want to cut you out a little bit early to go get lunch because I know you're hungry, right? So about 20 seconds, just if you want, you don't have to turn to a partner, but write it down. What's one thing that you're like, hey, I am three days. I can do this. Three weeks, I need to think about this. And then in maybe three months, right? So just take a minute to do that. And then I have a feedback form if you would be so kind to fill out in just a moment. But take a minute. Maybe you just want to do three days. Fine. Just do that. Like, go. All right. Kind of have 10 seconds to kind of wrap that up. Hopefully you picked your, uh, I call it the OT, people. One thing. One thing that you're like, okay, I'm going to nail that. I, I, gotta, I want to do that. I've got to start creating this belonging environment and doing the weave instead of doing the solo thing that we do that just adds more to our plate that you do not have time to do. Listen, educators, as we wrap up, 
you don't have time. You don't. I get it. I hear it all the time. I work internationally and I come along and I partner with beautiful people like you. Let's get super strategic on what is the standard asking them to know and be able to do. So use your curriculum but make sure it's addressing the standard. What are the barriers your kids are going to encounter? Offer two choices. Would you rather? Would you rather? Use that document for some ideas or come up with your own. And how can you do the weave? to support expert learning because they have to be self-aware and they have to manage and be socially aware and build a collaborative environment and make responsible decisions if you're going to give them choices. They have to learn that. Why don't they, why, they should just learn it with us, right? So take a moment and then, Sung, you can dismiss. Click on this bit.ly. There's a QR code. Would love your feedback. I know it was an hour. I would have loved to have been there in person, but at least, hey, we get to be virtual. So fill out the feedback for one minute. And then, Sung, go ahead and dismiss for lunch. Fabulous. Thank you, everybody. You are fabulous. Please, if you have any questions, my email's on that first slide. Or if you're like, hey, I want you to come to my school or whatever, then contact me. Let's let's go. I live here in Cali. <laughs> I live in Davis. I'm local. So I um, would love to come alongside and support in whatever way if you just have a question. So thank you, everybody. I'm just going to leave this up. You're all fabulous. Have a great lunch. And just know you are a game changer for your kids every day and in every way. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa.